cases. Um, just as you're comfortable, though, if, if you find that you don't want your cat walking across the screen, that's fine. Um, but Fair we enough. do so that you remain muted unless, unless you're speaking to the group. Yes, it's this thing where you can't really have two speakers at the same time. It, it really is not good for audio that way. So we encourage sort of one speaker at a time. And, and please do keep uh, your microphones on mute so that um, some of that background noise doesn't interfere with our gathering today. All right, Ashish, I think we have the minister ready to join us now. Fantastic, thank you. But all of our major hospitals in all of our major cities. Will you be able to mute everybody? We are full. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us today. On behalf of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, specifically the Edmonton chapter, the Calgary and Vancouver chapters as well, I am pleased to welcome you to this intimate virtual exchange with Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development, the Honourable Mariam Wansaf. My name is Ashifa and it's my job in the next hour to try to hold space for you to share your story, your experiences, and also to hear the stories and the voices from around this virtual table, around this kitchen table, if you will. If we were here in person doing this as we had initially intended, we would very likely be essentially around a table physically in person. Um, I'm not sure if we would have enough chairs for everybody at that point, but I'm certainly happy that we're doing this virtually so that we do have space uh, for everybody, and I would just hope that, um, as I said, my job to be holding space so we can share and hear each other. So that we can hear each other well, as I mentioned earlier, please do leave your microphones muted. Um, however, try to enable the atmosphere of being at a kitchen table. Please do turn on your cameras uh, as you're comfortable and as you wish to do so. Please note that this session is being recorded for the purposes of posting on the CCMW website for sharing amongst ourselves, but also to share with others so that they may also um, learn and hear of the wisdom uh, that, that we're likely to be sharing today. You are welcome to send in your questions and comments using the chat function. So in Zoom, um, you'll find that typically at the bottom of your screen will be a chat function. If you click on that, you'll be able to type in your question or comment. Um, and uh, in, inshallah, we will uh, address the questions at a Q&A session, at a question and answer session near the, uh, near the end of the hour. I would also ask that you use the raised hand function, which you will find under the participants tab. Um, so if you would like to speak, um, again, just to ensure that we can hear each other, uh, please use the raised hand function. We will call upon you and then you can be unmuted. If there aren't any questions or concerns right now, I don't see any raised hands functions, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to see that. I would now request Thazola Lee from Vancouver to unmute and offer a prayer for, on our behalf. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhu al-ladhina amanu stainu bi sabri wa sala inna allaha ma'a sabirin wa la takulu liman yuktalu fi sabilillahi amuat balahya'an wa la killa tash'urun wa la nabluwannakum bi shay'in min al-khawfi wal ju'i وَنَكْسِمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ أُولَئِكَ عَلَيْهِمْ صَلَوَاتٌ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَرَحْمَةٌ I mean, thank you, sister. In this I, moment, I, can I do the uh, translation? Thank you. Oh, you who believe, seek help through patience and prayer. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. 
and do not say about those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead, rather they are alive, but you perceive it not. And we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and fruits, but give glad tidings to the patient, who when disaster strikes them, they say, indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to him we will return. Those are the ones upon whom are blessings from the Lord and mercy, and it is those who are rightly guarded. Amen. Thank you very much. In this moment of reflection, I request that we collectively acknowledge the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on. Spanning generations, acknowledgement of the land is a traditional custom of indigenous peoples when welcoming outsiders onto their land and into their homes. To build respectful relationships, acknowledging the land is an important part of reconciliation. It honors the authentic history of North America, its original people, and tells the story of the creation of this country that has historically been missing. Please join me in consideration of where you are located right now, and also where you have lived or worked across Canada. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nation peoples and respect their histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. Thank you all for joining me. As I mentioned before, I hope you do feel that we are sitting together at a kitchen table. Um, I think we are now ready to move forward together to hold space for each other. To me, holding space means physically, mentally, and emotionally being present for someone. It means putting your focus on someone to support them as they feel their feelings. An important aspect of holding space is managing judgment while you are present. Those holding space helps set the tone for a kind, curious, uh, uh, courteous, excuse me, and judgment-free interaction where the other person can be vulnerable and like the term says, have space for them. I think we can agree that we like to create this kind of environment for ourselves um, to be able to share our perspectives, thoughts, our stories in our own words and from our own hearts. So as we hold space for each other, let's set aside all the hats that we may be wearing and carrying, and if you will, just be you. Even if you are bringing to the kitchen table someone else's experiences, it's still from you unless you have been directly quoting from them or something, of course. Um, as we picture ourselves at a huge kitchen with enough seating around the table for all of us, I would like to call upon the president of the Edmonton CCMW chapter, Nassim Pirani. If you could please unmute yourself, thank you. Thank you, Ashifa. The Honorable Marian Monsaf, is Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Rural Economic Development. She is the first Afghan Canadian Member of Parliament in Canada's history and the first Muslim to serve as a federal cabinet minister. Minister Monsef is recognized as influential in shaping the gender equality conversation in Canada and around the world. Mr. Monsef is equally committed to bringing the voice of rural Canada to the cabinet table, where she's working on important rural economic development priorities, including expanding access to broadband connectivity. Congratulations on launching the Universal Broadband Fund to support bringing internet to rural and remote communities across Canada. Minister Monsef, we have deep confidence and trust in you. When you and I met in Toronto in March at the National CCMW meeting, just before COVID, you communicated me to me the desire to meet the CCMW Edmonton chapter members. You have honored this commitment despite needing to cancel the event due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. We feel very honored to have you with us today. Thank you. 
We would be overjoyed to have you visit us in person once the pandemic has resolved and can visit our CCM Legacy in Edmonton. Legacy in Edmonton of the first mosque built in North America, Al Rashid Mosque, located at Fort Edmonton Park. It was built and restored by Muslim women. Us, we are so blessed. Thank you. We also have three schools named after the three prominent Muslim women in Edmonton. And Edmonton is home to the most northern, northern Islamic garden, the Aga Khan Garden at the University of Alberta's Botanic Garden. On behalf of the Western Canada CCMW chapters, Edmonton, Calgary and Vancouver, it is my great pleasure to welcome you, Minister Monser. Allah bless you all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Uh, bonjour, Anin. Salam alaikum. I'm joining you from the nation's capital on Algonquin territory. Uh, I haven't left this spot for many hours, but I have been so looking forward to this conversation. Um, we, we had a chance to come together uh, on, on Sunday, I think it was Sunday, right, Nazad? Um, to, to honor and celebrate um, just a few of the amazing Muslim women who inspire. And it was the first time that I had the privilege of hearing uh, from Alberta's LG, uh, Her Excellency Salma Khani, who's here tonight. I see her in 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 one of the uh, boxes here. Um, it is such an honor to get to spend, uh, you know, two days in one week with you. Uh, and I was so moved by the conversation uh, on Sunday. Um, this weekend, you know, it, it was a rainy day outside, but I left that call filled with so much hope and so much energy and that we get to have a conversation tonight with, with our Muslim sisters. And I see a few brothers on the line too uh, in, in, in the Western region. Um, how fortunate am I? I already see that colleagues are asking about uh, the Universal Broadband Fund, which we launched last Monday. This is the largest program for high-speed internet connectivity in Canada's history. The goal is to support every community to get connected. Uh, we've accelerated our timelines. We've put significant investments in, and there's a rapid response stream. So my friend from Kananaskis, I have visited Kananaskis. It is a beautiful place, and absolutely, just like every other corner of this big, beautiful country, it should have access to this essential service. My best advice to communities, particularly you, Councillor Afsar, who are interested in getting that high-speed connectivity is to connect with the concierge service or the pathfinder service we've set up specifically for smaller communities who don't have the wherewithal or the capacity to be able to navigate this very complex process. We've made the applications as simple as possible and you can pick up the phone and call the concierge service. The, the number is 1-800-328-6189 or you can visit the website for the Universal Broadband Fund. My team's just posted it on the chat box for anybody who's interested. Um, I also see uh, one of my favorite Canadians is on the line. Uh, I see Alia Hagban is here. Uh, and Alia, along with several of you, were at that event uh, just before COVID. When we were able to come together, I, I had the opportunity to be part of your dinner. Uh, Nina, I remember you too. Um, we were able to, you know, uh, there was a spoken artist and, and then you had this really wonderful facilitator who was trying to bring everybody back in the room, kind of like our, our host here tonight did. Ashifa, you know, made us feel like we're, we're all part of the same family and we truly are. We may be separated by time zones, we may be separated by distance, and we may be, you know, 
separated for a little bit longer as we managed to get through COVID, but we are part of the same family. Um, the Sadi poem, right? We're, we are all part of the same body. We are organs of the same body. Uh, and I very much look forward to the next opportunity we have to actually be in each other's presence. But Nassim, this is, this is as, as close as it's going to get for now. So how do we make the most of our time together tonight? And how do we make the most of the moment in which we find ourselves in? Um, I, I don't know about you, but for me, COVID has been um, a, a stark reminder of how, how precious time with loved ones is. Uh, the the, the um, verses from the Quran that, that Tazu sh shared earlier, um, you know, there, there has been a, a lot of loss during COVID. Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of loved ones are gone. Uh, and, you know, people didn't get a chance to come together and grieve. Uh, at the same time, people didn't get to come together and celebrate, whether it was anniversaries or weddings or birthdays. Uh, so there's a lot of pent up energy out there, both both sad and and happiness. There's also this matter of a pandemic for us to to get through. So, as this very difficult year comes to an end, I want us to think about December seventh. December seventh marks fifty years since the Royal Commission on the Status of Women tabled its groundbreaking report in the House of Commons. This report was the result of three years of work um, and decades of advocacy. And when it was tabled in the House of Commons, just down the street here, uh, this report included 167 recommendations. And the first recommendation was about women being able to own their own homes, a place to call home, being able to own a home, qualify for a mortgage without requiring their husband's signature. And then the report goes on to talk about pay equity and childcare and supports for grassroots women's organizations. And we have made a lot of progress. You know, there's a, there's a minister for the, for for women because that was one of the recommendations from the report. And we've made a lot of progress to be sure, but all that progress is at stake right now. It was at stake, you know, because progress is never carved in stone, but, it, but it's at stake now because we're seeing with COVID that women have been hit hardest with jobs loss, with income loss, with increases in gender-based violence. They are on the front lines of the fight against COVID, particularly racialized uh, women uh, are caring for many who are in need of that care right now. And of course, taking on additional unpaid care responsibilities for their own loved ones. Parents like my sister who helped their little ones with online learning and trying to keep these very curious, very energetic, you know, little ones uh, entertained uh, and well during these difficult times. So we have, we stand at a crossroads for all women. We stand at a crossroads, particularly for those who've been on the margins of societies for too long, where we stand the chance to lose the hard won gains of previous decades, if we're not careful if we're not focused, if we're not united as a movement. We also have the opportunity to rebuild better the systems in which we live, work, the systems that govern us. We have a chance to put forward a national plan for early learning and childcare. We have a plan to move forward and, and we're, we're looking forward to a national action plan on addressing and preventing gender-based violence, moving forward with climate action in a big, big way to net zero by 2050 and to do right by the first peoples of this land and accelerate the pace of reconciliation too. To just name a few. We can't do that though without you. And to my Muslim sisters and brothers on the line, I know that in 
every corner of this great country. Muslims are making a world of difference. And I know that Muslims are making a world of difference because I have heard from you, I have visited you, and because I have watched what you've been able to achieve over the past five years that, that I've been a politician. Muslims have dealt with all sorts of stigma and discrimination, but Muslims are also really well represented in the House of Commons. We have Iqra Khalid, who stood there in the House of Commons and took a lot of heat for standing up and simply saying, hey, let's study the term Islamophobia and other forms of racism. We have colleagues like Omar al Ghabra who actually said, are you doing another thing with CCMW tonight? Didn't you do something with them earlier this week? And I said, yes, I'm going back. We have colleagues like Minister Ahmed Hussein, who is brilliant and he's leading our social uh, supports. He's leading the supports for seniors, for children. He's the guy who leads the national housing strategy. He's the guy who's put forward, forward the most recent rapid response program for housing the most vulnerable. He's also the guy leading the early learning and childcare strategy and supports for the charitable sector. We have an amazing caucus of colleagues who are advocating for their communities and are also really effective representatives of Muslims. And we draw our inspiration from you. I will tell you this though, the best part of these jobs has been the people part. Going into classrooms, going into events like the dinner that, that we had uh, with you, it seems like, years ago, but just last March. The best parts of the job are being able to connect with you where you are, look you in the eye and find out what you're up to and what's working and what more needs to be done. But that part of the job for the time being has been taken away. This very cruel disease at a time when we need to stay connected with our loved ones, with our communities, with our allies and accomplices has forced us to keep apart. What I would appreciate from you tonight in the conversation is how do we do three things? How do we make sure that women are safe? And when I use the word women, I'm using it broadly to include trans women, non-binary women, two-spirit folks as well, uh, non-binary folks and two-spirit folks as well. How do we make sure that women are safe? How do we make sure that they are working and they're working in good jobs? And how do we make sure that their families are cared for? The government can put forward, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to support thousands of organizations on the front lines of this work. We can change some laws. We can play the role of a convener. What can we do together? Women, you know, before the pandemic, Canada's economy was the best in the G7. We had the highest, we had the highest number of uh, young people working, those with disabilities working, um, women working. Uh, we had the lowest unemployment rate that we've had, that we'd had in 40 years. How do we make sure that we get women back to work? How do we ensure that the incredible women with all their diversities across the country also have opportunities to be leaders in decision-making tables, like within the government of Canada, but otherwise too? And how do we ensure that their families are cared for, you know, given that, you know, the, the jurisdictions around long-term care, for example, are, are very much provincial. Uh, early learning and child care, very much uh, provincial with some uh, participation from the federal government. And tell us a little bit about where you're at. Um, aside from public policy, just a check-in would be nice to hear how you're holding up, what are you doing that's working and helping you cope with everything that COVID comes with and what is just difficult and unbearable if you're comfortable to share. That check-in would be really helpful too. So. Um, I know it's a little late and um, this was not the most clear I've ever been in a conversation, but Ashifa, I, I really appreciate 
that you convened us around your kitchen table virtually uh, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Mr. Monsef. And absolutely, you are very articulate uh, for as late as it is there with as crazy busy as your schedule is. Thank you so much, Maria and John. It's, um, it's, not, it's not late. It's just well, I haven't moved from this spot. So I'm a little... <laughs> Well, certainly later than it is here in Alberta and BC. Um, we'd like to remind everyone that this is very much a kitchen table. Yes, please join me at my kitchen table. I will have the chai on soon. Um, but we'd like to uh, share comments and questions with the minister. Uh, please use the chat function. Um, but hopefully, um, I have a few points, but I just wanted to quickly breeze through them um, to again uh, say, please, let's open this space for sharing um, and, and for providing space for, for each other. Um, we do have a few um, women that have stepped up um, as courageous and brave as they are to share uh, with, with, with us and with you, Minister. We'd first hear from Nermin Jamama, the proud mother and daughter from Edmonton. Next, we have Dr. Amber Fatima Riaz, a university instructor, mother and wife from Vancouver. Then we'll head back to Alberta and hear hopefully from Tahira Ibrahim, an active member of the Calgary community. I say hopefully because I hope we're not running out of time. Um, and then going north to Edmonton from Calgary, will we hear from Rula Mustafa, an accredited mediator and lawyer pursuing an MBA now. And then we'll stay in Edmonton and hear from Nur al Hidi, who works with the Al Rashid Mosque in Edmonton, Canada's first mosque. So, Nermeen, if you would unmute yourself, we'll um, let the speakers just follow right after you. Uh, you don't need to come back to me. I, I want to give this time and space to hear from you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ashifa. Um, Assalamu alaikum, Minister Mansef and fellow participants. It is a pleasure to be with you today, and I'm honored to share my story. I am part of what is known as the sandwich generation. I am raising my son and at the same time taking care of my mother who lives with us. Uh, affordable childcare needs to be a focus of the government. In my opinion, this will go a long ways in furthering the cause of women and getting women uh, back into the workforce with support and much needed support that, that they need. This year with the COVID-19 pandemic has been very challenging for me. A great deal of my time has been spent trying to balance working full time from home, homeschooling my son and grocery shopping for our family, which let's be honest, has turned into a mission of epic proportions masks, gloves, and of course, keeping a six feet distance between myself and the other shoppers. Now that my son is back in school, we take showers as soon as we get home to protect Nanima or grandma from getting sick. We have become more careful with our hugs to keep each other safe. My days are long and my evenings are longer. My hands are dry and chapped from all the constant hand washing, but my fridge is full. This year has been, it hasn't been all gloom and doom. One good thing that has come out of this pandemic is my cooking and more importantly, my baking skills have improved immensely. I make wholesome, fresh food to feed my family and that gives me great joy. The pandemic has brought us closer together. Every day we are thankful for our loved ones, friends, family, and for each other. We eat together, we pray together, and we give thanks together. It has been a long journey, but we are hopeful that inshallah, a vaccine will be ready in the new year. That our lives, once dominated by the fear and threat of coronavirus, will find a new, more familiar normal. Thank you, Minister Monsef, for all that you are doing for women in helping to lighten our burden and for being with us here today to hear our stories for the hafiz. So I think I'm next. Um, Assalamu alaikum, hello. Um, thank you, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak um, directly to um, the minister, also to um, so many of the luminaries who've joined us on this call today. 
I really had not expected to have names like our lieutenant governor and, you know, um, people who work at Al Rashid Mosque and the minister. And I'm, I'm a little starstruck, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I had an eloquent um, script prepared, but I think I want to speak more directly to the minister's three questions. Um, the questions about women's safety, the questions about how to keep women working and what the federal government could do to um, sort of contribute to women's um, future a little bit more in Canada. I'll, I'll say very quickly a few words about my own experience as far as the, 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 the pandemic is concerned. I was working full time and we went into lockdown. I was lucky enough to be able to move to a work from home situation, except that my work situation was such that I had to be online all the time for more than eight hours a day. But at that time, the, both of my kids, my 17 year old daughter and my 12 year old son were also online all day. Um, my husband was also working from home. It was, um, we live in an, a small apartment, um, so we were noisy and in each other's space all of the time. Um, we also faced quite a bit of family loss. Um, we attended four funerals um, virtually um, during the pandemic due to the, the, the disease itself. Um, we were lucky that we could hug each other um, so, you know, that was one good thing, um, but we were attending online funerals that it's the hardest thing that anybody can ever imagine doing, um, honestly, sorry. Um, we just had news of a recent loss and my son's immediate reaction was, mom, we don't have to attend another funeral, do we? And I'm like, nope, they're not doing anything virtually. So, you know, it was almost a, a, a relief that we didn't have to attend another funeral. But the news of the death was, it, it did trigger a few, few emotions that I don't want to go down the path for. I was laid off in September. Um, so I'm now looking for work again. And it is, again, a really, really hard thing to do. I'm the type of person who can walk into a workspace and I can say, are you guys hiring? Here's my resume, can we talk? And I can't do that because of the pandemic. Um, so that's hard, but you know, I have hope. Um, the federal government support, the programs that you guys put in place with the CERB, with the CEWS, with the new version of CERB that was pushed through parliament, all of those are, are hopeful signs. It, it gives us a little bit of a breathing space. We are not that desperate um, financially. We feel taken care of when it comes to the federal government, but the types of jobs that are available right now, um, few and far between, very hard to pin down. Um, and then because the children are in school and there's no before and after care for older kids, um, women like me get stuck in that, I have only four hours to do my job hunting because then it's school pickup time, trying to find activities for the kids, trying to make sure that they're taken care of. So. Um, in, in, in that sense, I feel like we're kind of ignored almost, right? Because hubbies need their space, hubbies need their time, parents need their time, their energy, the kids need their time, the kids need their energy. So there's very little time for us to devote to our careers and our job hunts. So I think that provincial governments, municipal governments, and federal governments could be doing a lot more outreach, I think, um, for targeted specifically to women. And part of that comes from um, childcare, opening up more spots, making more activities available, safe, and you know, targeted more to community. So that's mine. I think we're moving on to our next speaker. I believe it's my turn. Um, so, sound like a Yali Madad to everyone. Um, so, Minister Monsef, I'm going to be sharing a story on behalf of a family with their permission. Um, and it's around the technology gap. Um, and I, I think it's worth recognizing and appreciating the fact that this was made possible 
we are crossing and hopefully in almost every corner of the country because not only do we have access to Wi-Fi or data, we have access to the hardware that makes this possible. And sometimes it's not only a laptop, it's a webcam or a headset or a microphone. Um, and I think sometimes we can, we can take that for granted that for a lot of us, being able to move into a quarantine space is a lot more smooth when we have the technology available to us. So the story that was shared with me was around the technology gap and lack of digital devices. So there was a family that came um, to Calgary shortly as the pandemic began and as school and workplaces were shifting to an online environment. And out of a family of five, four of those members were learning online, including one adult learner who's the father. And they had a single cell phone to work off of. Now, um, obviously in all parts of the country, there's been a lot of groundswell from the community and there were a few technology drives. And so I believe the family was able to obtain a laptop, but again, they have about a device and a half or so to ensure that that learning takes place. So as you can imagine, the lack of hardware can impact meaningful learning experiences. It enhances the homework gap. So um, preventing academic performance for the children as well as the father. And in the father's case, as it can be with mothers as well, of course, um, that it then leads to an employment gap. So the ability to access English, access the language skills to find gainful employment can impact all adult learners who are in this situation. In addition to that, um, it impedes social connection, community building, and especially for newcomers, the ability to integrate into Canadian society and understand how it works. The technology gap can impact the fundamental ability to access and understand where other resources are, impacting things like food security for women in unstable home situations, access to women's shelters as well, and just general family services. So we're seeing that that technology gap is a fundamental piece in terms of how quarantine is experienced. Um, by different um, types of families, by women, by um, single mothers, um, and of course is, is always um, disproportionately impacting newcomers to Canada. I will leave it there and, and give room for the next speaker. Rula, are you able to unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity that you give me to speak in front of the Honorable Minister and everyone. Uh, I actually, it's good that I speak now so I can build on what um, uh, Jabra has actually uh, spoken about, uh, newcomers opportunity during COVID-19. I actually still uh, consider myself newcomer and I also have like uh, family members who joined me a year and a half after I came to Canada. So uh, I see how actually they are very concerned uh, around finding jobs. They were actually looking for the time when they finished their link schools. So they joined the workforce, but the moment they finished actually the moment uh, COVID-19 hit and they feel so hopeless now that there is no uh, maybe chance for this year or even the uh, year after to find a job and uh, i feel like from my experience working with newcomers that employment is very important especially like to boost uh, the uh, newcomer integration into the canadian community and to also like enhance their mental health as well i feel they are so affected when they are they can't feel that they are actually uh, productive uh, members of the community and they can't even contribute back to the community I also want to highlight one more important uh, thing that I feel it's very, uh, very much hit during COVID, which is like senior mental health. I have an elder dad who actually just staying at home now. He's already like was suffering homesickness, and also um, he, he he now he doesn't have any means for entertainment, despite the fact that I always try to spend like an hour with him to get him out of the home for a walk in the morning and then in the evening try like to also play maybe some cards with him. I feel he's so much like uh, depressed. He's so much like lonely because he can't do any other activities. So maybe a question that we all have to ask ourselves, like how can we get actually uh, seniors 
maybe even virtually online these days during COVID-19. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Assalamu alaikum. I guess I'm next. Um, I'm going to build up just a little bit on what everybody said. Um, as the communications director in Rashid Mosque, I have, I have the honor and privilege to work with a lot of Muslims and serve them every single day. Um, despite the pandemic hitting us hard, things did not slow down because we are a center that does serve um, Muslims, I would say, even in Alberta, not only in Edmonton. And I, and I agree with Rula in particular in terms of the mental health. And I think Amber touched on it a little bit when she said that we don't have time for ourselves anymore. And I think it's really affecting our mental health and particularly for single moms. Um, having to be home with your children, working full time and whatnot, there's a lot of financial restraint on them. And when you're a single parent, really, you don't get a break. The kids are there all the time and you're working there 24 hours. And then in some of the cases too, when they have to take care of their parents or their elders, it is honestly um, deteriorating the mental health um, condition that they have. Um, also for them, and this is not only for single moms, parents who have children with special needs, um, a lot of the support in terms of um, seeing physicians or seeing psychiatrists and whatnot, um, a lot of the support from the schools with kids with ADHD, ODD, anxiety disorders, it, it's been looking very, very different and parents are struggling and it's really affecting them very much so. Um, Domestic violence has really increased in a major way. I know with our work with um, shelters specifically for Muslim women like Nista Home, they've seen an uprise, an unbelievable uprise in cases of domestic violence, but you only have so much capacity, you only have so much support that you can provide. Um, and it is leaving women living in unsafe spaces, not having access to the support that they do need. The community, like uh, I'm in Edmonton, so we're very blessed to have a very strong community that does come together, whether through organizations like Arashid Mosque or through other mosques or Nisa Home or Ifsa and whatnot. So everybody kind of huddles together and provides that support, but we still need more. We still need the government to step up and make sure that women are safe in their environments. Um, and I think in particular for Muslim women, it's more difficult because we do not only have the safety of the women, we do have the cultural restraints that do affect all of these decisions. Um, so it is, if it's, like they say, um, you, um, a, one out of 10 women leave a domestic violence situation. I think for Muslim women, it's one out of 20 or 30 because of the cultural restraints that, is, that are in place. Um, one other aspect that I wanted to touch on as well um, that is um, very concerning is um, the visibly Muslim girls in particular with the uprise of Islamophobia. And this is not particularly connected to COVID, but we've seen an increase of Islamophobia and white supremacy groups um, coming to the mosque, um, steering trouble and whatnot. And I think this is a concern for all Muslims, but I've seen it to be a very big concern for visibly Muslim girls, young girls who are afraid to be themselves, who are afraid to express who they are because they are afraid that um, something is going to happen to them. They're, they're, they're questioning their own identity, which is, to me is very dangerous because at that age, that's when they develop, right? Um, and with um, things like Bill 21, they're even, like, to me personally, I know we do have representation in the House of Common of a lot of Muslims, which is amazing, but I do think we are hugely underrepresented in a lot of fields. To a point where we are still celebrating our first, the first Muslim woman to do this to do this and to do that, to take this position. We shouldn't be like that. We should be far ahead of that. It's still great that it's happening, but the change is not, it's slow. And with our young girls who are our future, afraid of embracing who they are, their beliefs and their values, it's, it's just very concerning. Um, I thank you very much for your time and uh, salam alaikum. Thank you so much, uh, everyone who has just uh, shared. Uh, you're all phenomenal. Um, thank you for the courage um, to, to share with all of us. And, and thank you, everyone, for allowing the space um, for, for the sharing. Um, I'd like to thank you for your courage, your strength, uh, your confidence for not being small.
uh, and mostly for your vulnerability, as it may give relief to others uh, for their own vulnerabilities. Thank you for being role models today and every day. Uh, you're all phenomenal. Thank you. We are with the help with Joanna and staff from the minister's office and the minister herself. Um, let's hear from some others. I know that there have been questions in the chat box uh, and some other comments as well. I did share a, a question that was shared with me. Um, and so sorry, I should have adjusted uh, what I had put back out there, but I wanted the question to be shared with everybody, um, but, but just anonymously. So uh, with that, um, Joanna? Yes, I think we have a question from Farida first on childcare. Uh, so how about Farida, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question directly to the minister. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is that Quebec has for a long time put in place a childcare system that really favors working mothers and actually favors low-income families and middle-income, obviously. It's, it's non-discriminatory. It doesn't matter on your income. It's one rate for everybody. And as you all know, it's an extremely low rate that anybody can afford. Um, what I'm saying is that since Quebec really thinks of the welfare of working mothers, why can't the rest of Canada adopt this attitude? Um, after all, it does take money and Quebec is willing to put the financial responsibility and back this system. Why can't the other provinces do the same? That's my question. Uh, do, not, do they not have public funds? Uh, do, what are their priorities? Don't, do they not want to get their priorities right? That's my question, actually. Wonderful, thank you, Farida. I think we have another question also from Anna. So we'll just try to bundle, we're running a little bit low on time now, so I'll try to bundle a few questions together so the minister can just take notes and answer uh, them all at once. Uh, so I believe I have Anna um, with a question. Is Anna still on? Sometimes Anna has connectivity problems. She's in Northern Ontario. Um, in past phone calls, we've had a hard time connecting with Anna by voice. That is entirely fair and something we are very aware of. <laughs> also, especially with our files, I'm sure the minister will have something to say about that aspect as well. But the question that we received from her in the chat was about how do we educate our community organizations so they hear the cries of, of the North and remote communities. Oh, I see a chat from Anna now. Uh, yes, I think there are some issues with mute. She said, Nina is my voice. I'm, oh, Anna, that is such an honor. Anna is, a, is, is huge in the uh, labor movement also, and she's an educator, um, a leader. She's, yeah, she's talking a lot. Oh, oh, she always reaches out and tries to help others. To, she's talking about wrongful layoffs and terminations that are on the rise. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I, I'm not as eloquent as you. Well, hopefully she can hop back on when she can. I'll help on this case. I'll pass it back to the minister uh, so, so she can answer. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, thank you to Narmeen, to Amber, Tahira, Rola, Noor, uh, for your very thoughtful comments and the questions that, that you've shared. And, and Farida, you too. Um, where to begin? Let's start with the kids. Let's start with childcare. Uh, I agree um, that the Quebec model is one that we should all be looking at and you know, seeing their economic growth as a result of that substantive but important investment has been really, really helpful for us. We are certainly drawing inspiration from from our colleagues in Quebec, from families in Quebec. We've seen the impact that it has in getting women, keeping women in the workforce, the, the GDP improvements that the province has seen to have women participating, those who choose to, in the workforce. And the key word that you used, Farida, was, was it Farida? It was Farida. It was 
system. We do not have a child care system in Canada right now. As Professor Kate Bazanson says, we have a child care market, but not a system. And that is what, what we are inspiring, inspired by and working to develop. The federal government, of course, has its jurisdiction. Provinces and territory, provinces specifically have been doing this work. They're ahead of us. They, they invest a substantial amount in early learning and child care. But we were able to, in our first mandate, begin the work of, uh, first of all, having an early learning and child care framework. Second, having a framework that was distinction-based for Métis, Inuit, and First Nation early learning and childcare. And third, funds set aside, multi-year funds set aside to develop and support over 40,000 childcare spaces. And each province, we, we signed a bilateral agreement with them. So that was our portion. They would, of course, add on to it. Uh, and, and colleagues in the West, I would say that, that you know, there has been progress made. So we have a pathway to work once we've developed, uh, you know, the, the next stages, once we've set up a secretariat for early learning and child care, you know, you heard the prime minister make that commitment in the speech from the throne that we're moving forward with this. And so we are. The next stage would be to, first of all, make sure parliament is on board with whatever uh, proposal is moved forward upon. And then second is to go into um, agreements with provinces who are willing to move ahead with us. So, you know, the Quebec model works. We've seen it work. Childcare should be accessible. It should be affordable and it should be quality. And that's one of the biggest lessons that we've learned from our, our neighbors in Quebec, that that quality piece is essential. Um, I want to speak to um, uh, our friends. Narmeen, you spoke so beautifully. I hope you're like writing stories in your spare time. And then I hope you write a book and make a lot of money from, from it because I very much, I could listen to you for hours. That was beautiful. Um, I come from a family that, that really cherished poetry and the written word as well as the spoken word so um, I have a lot of respect for those who take the time to um, be as articulate as you are in your story um, it's beautiful to hear that you know where you've made the most of this very difficult time being you know the sandwich generation looking after the little one and your mom uh, and I'm glad that you know, your mom and and your little one have time together. I think that's truly a gift. Uh, I didn't realize how big a gift it was until I had to say goodbye to, to my grandparents. But, you know, that that's a gift. But what you shared, and I think that um, our friend also Amber shared, is how exhausting it must be to be moms right now. How exhausting you all must be, frankly, for, for dealing with the things that, that you're dealing with and then looking after everybody who counts on you for all the reasons they do to, to make sure that they're well. We need you in the workforce. We need you around decision-making tables. You belong there. Um, for those of you who haven't, you know, I, I share this message with, with every group that I connect with. The Government of Canada's appointments are open. Anybody can apply. They're merit-based, and we are also looking to enhance diversity around the various boards and agencies, tables that the Government of Canada uh, has that appointment power. Um, you know, if, if you haven't yet had a chance to look, please take a look at the Government of Canada's appointments page. You just have to Google those words and it'll pop up and share it with others in your networks. We are always looking for the best and the brightest to represent those whose voices perhaps haven't always been at the table. Um, and that's one of the ways that these systems change. But let me speak specifically to the conversation that was that was had around jobs and workforce uh, participation. You heard the Prime Minister talk about 1 million jobs as part of our recovery from the pandemic. And those 1 million jobs will come from a variety of sectors, you know, the broadband announcement that the uh, access to high speed internet, that will lead to job creation for sure. But more specifically, I think it was on Monday, 
all the days have blurred. On Monday, the Prime Minister and our Minister for Workforce Development, who's who's a BC native herself, Minister Carla Qualtrough, um, made a pretty important announcement, uh, and it was part of our plan to get to one million jobs. The the announcement that they made was uh, an investment by the federal government of one point five billion dollars through the workforce development agreements that we have with each of the 13 provinces and territories to provide additional funding for them so that they could provide training, employment counseling, and other services for Canadians working in sectors impacted by the pandemic. Now, all the numbers are showing us that women have been hit hardest and that racialized women particularly, and we, we know that we are for the first time collecting disaggregated data that tells us that, that South Asian women, for example, are really struggling uh, and, and you know they are among the most educated in the country. So there's a plan to get women back to work. This is part of it. Childcare is most certainly part of it. Uh, and then, you know, making sure that women are safe. To, to those of you who spoke about the safety of women and the rates of gender based violence being on the rise, for the first few months of COVID, I, I would dream about those women and those little kids trapped in the same house as the most dangerous person in their lives pretty much every night. They haunted me. We were, we were able to act very quickly and got uh, about, at this point now, $100 million for rapid response to support frontline organizations who are, you know, shelters, sexual assault centers, but also other gender-based violence supports. So... And, and instead of going through an application-based process, we said, what's the quickest way to get the funds to the front lines? And we partnered with the Canadian Women's Foundation and the Women's Shelters Canada folks. And we were able to sign agreements with them. And then they delivered into bank accounts electronically funds to organizations. So, and, and Sakina Homes and, and, and other organizations are among the you know, 1,500 organizations across the country that got direct supports. If you know an organization, or or plural, several, who are struggling, who, you know, need to get laptops to be able to support their clients electronically, who need to be able to get, you know, cell phones for their clients because they just left the home without anything, who need cleaning supplies or PPE or supports for their staff or whatever, please share those organizations' names with us. We are working to ensure that there are as many open doors as possible for women and children in their hour of need. The Prime Minister made it a priority. It was within the first 48 hours of the pandemic that he was very much on board and it was part of our response early on. So share with us the names of those organizations and, and tell others to do the same that you speak with. We will find a way to support those uh, that, that you know obviously meet the criteria, but the eligibility criteria, we've kept it as flexible and as simple as possible because we know how difficult the situation is right now. And we also expect that we're gonna see a drastic surge in supports uh, being sought on the other side of the pandemic and we're preparing for that too. So that's for the immediate. The rapid response housing envelope that Minister Hussein uh, announced um, includes supports for those who want to build modular housing, for example. Uh, so I would highly encourage you, if you haven't already, to take a look at the National Housing Strategy. It's a place to call home. Uh, and all sorts of organizations can qualify for these dollars. Uh, and, and, you know, as someone who stayed in a women's shelter, I can tell you that women's shelter was most certainly a, a, a lifesaver. We were at a crossroads in our lives and it offered us a safe place to just stop and breathe and be safe. But it was actually the transition housing uh, 
that helped us piece back what was broken and start a new chapter. So we also need to be talking about supportive housing uh, and not just shelters, uh, both go hand in hand. So the national housing strategy, the rapid response funds uh, can help in the more medium term. In the immediate, we can provide direct dollars to these organizations who are struggling right now because there is nothing more painful than knowing that, you know, that one out of 10 or one out of 20, she worked up the courage to leave. And then she found a way to safely leave. And then the place that she went to, she was turned away from. That's too much to bear. And, and we can do something about that. So please follow up and, and we'd love to, we'd love to help where we can. Tahira. You asked a very thoughtful question about the technology gap and the lack of technical technological devices. Uh, and you you did something that you know no one I have spoken with about this file has been able to do to date, which is make the very clear case and tell a very effective story of how everybody in the family is uh, left behind if we don't address this. The, the access piece, somebody here asked earlier, how will the Universal Broadband Fund help? The Universal Broadband Fund helps the 60% of rural Canadians, two thirds of indigenous Canadians, and 2% of urban or suburban Canadians who don't have access begin to get ready to have that access. There's a rapid response for those who can have that access over the next year. So projects that put an antenna on households, they'll get support through the rapid response stream. Projects that, you know, in, in some of the more rural and uh, isolated regions in our country, there are big community centers that used to be alive with all sorts of activities, but they're empty on the inside. They have big parking lots. And what we've seen in some communities are parents and families going into municipal buildings, uh, parking lots, or Tim Hortons, where there are Tim Hortons, and using the Wi-Fi there. So we've said, look, those empty buildings, if you want to get them connected, we will support you with that so that people have another place to go to during the pandemic to get that connectivity as we invest in more longer term projects. So the new fund also has stipulations for affordability. If you're going to use government funds to build, the, the service that, that the service providers need to provide has to have a really significant affordability component and enable open access, which leads to competition, which leads to affordability. A little bit too nerdy, but let me talk to you about the Computers for Schools program and the Connecting Families program. The Connecting Families program offers a $10 a month data plan to families of modest means with children. And the, the bigger telcos offer this program. So if, if you want to share that with a family that you know could use it, um, this, is, this is a data plan that, that could be really, really helpful. For the hardware in, itself, um, the Computers for Schools program is a pretty exciting program. You know, the, these devices, um, young people get training on how to refurbish and, and you know, do the, do the work that they need to do on the devices. And then those devices are donated to schools for kids of modest means to be able to use. We need, we, we, you know, those conversations around affordability, access, and literacy are happening. But I promise you, Sahara, that that story that you shared, like I'm taking notes over here, um, is one that I'm going to share over and over again. And, and I promise you that we carry these stories with, with the care that we need to because we know how powerful they can be. So I thank you for that. Rola, about seniors. I think that was your question was about elders. Uh, who you are so right, um, the, the most precious people in society with, with all the lessons to overcome all sorts of hardships over so many generations and this cruel disease targets them in a, in a really unfair way. Um, I too am worried about mental health colleagues. Uh, I started a mental health advocacy group when I was in university. I'm a psychology major and I don't think anybody's okay right now. I haven't met anybody who's like, oh, things are great. No one's okay right now. And I think that's step one. 
talking about it. There's a stigma associated with mental illness. There's a stigma associated with gender-based violence and admitting that you're experiencing it. But talking about mental illness, the, the most powerful way to address the stigma is to have conversations like this, open conversations about it. And when that stigma is addressed, people are more likely to seek the help they need. And for those who are fortunate enough to have internet access, which is, you know, a great majority of Canadians, but you know, for those who are fortunate enough to have internet access, there's the Wellness Together uh, website, which offers counseling and supports direct connection with professionals who can provide that uh, counseling supports for those who need it. If you've not heard about the Wellness Together uh, website, um, take a look. Uh, the, it's a really helpful resource that we've, we've invested quite a bit in. Uh, we've also invested in the Kids Helpline we know that there are a lot of little ones who, who need somebody to talk to or not so little ones who need somebody to talk to. So the, the Kids Helpline has received funds. We've, we've provided additional supports to provinces and territories who deliver this work, but you are absolutely right. On the other side of this thing, there's gonna be a generation of broken kids, broken Canadians who need a bit of support to get get through and, and heal from the various traumas endured during the pandemic, we're aware of that. For seniors specifically, the New Horizons program is a beloved program across the country. It provides meaningful funding for organizations that support seniors across the country. The deadline for that program for this year's intake was extended as per requests that our uh, partners across the country had made. Uh, and those programs are key in, you know, and these organizations know, know their communities best. They've been able to pivot online. They've been able to, you know, change their Meals on Wheels program in a way that is safe, but also provides that check-in for seniors that they would visit on a regular basis. I will say if if you have ideas on how to provide better, stronger mental health supports, and newer, this speaks to your question, particularly for single moms and for parents who have additional care responsibilities for those with special needs. Um, I'd like to hear from you. We're hearing particularly from from diaspora communities, from from racialized communities that there there is a need for community based supports that are offered by leaders and members of the communities themselves for the community and you know particularly for women uh, i'm very much interested in hearing some ideas about what those programs look like and how we could support them to get set up quickly and efficiently I'm very much interested. I'm also interested in uh, ensuring that scholars within racialized communities are able to do research for and on their own communities. So for the academics on the line uh, and those you know, if you're interested and have a research project specifically around women and their experiences and their realities, we want to hear from you very, very soon. Obviously, we're in rapid response mode right now, and we do need to respond to COVID. There are some programs that we can set up very quickly. Some programs are already happening, and they just need a little extra boost. But we should also be investing in some uh, more medium-term studies that can track the impact of the pandemic and all the other factors that, that play into it. Um, I, I see folks here talking about um, uh, emotional labor. Uh, I see the wonderful Alia um, being kind and lovely as she always is. I see offers in the chat line about people who want to help 
address and prevent gender-based violence, reach out to our team. We'll connect you with organizations in your own communities. Or if you have something to say as we develop a national action plan, if you want to be part of the conversation on a more longer time, in, in a more detailed basis, we'd like to hear from you. Uh, okay, now you're all typing really, really fast. Um, food security uh, is brought up here. You know what I heard, and I haven't been able to see the data on this. I heard that for those families of modest means, the first thing they did when they cashed their CERB check or got the CERB, they ate better. That's the first thing they did. Um, we also have invested in, in food banks and in food programs. Uh, and my colleague, Minister Bibo, our, our agriculture minister particularly, has been working very hard on this front. Ag agriculture producers and processors across the country have been helping with the food security challenges. They they have stepped up in really brilliant ways and we're grateful to them and all the ways that they have shown just how essential they are to our survival. Um, and you know that sector as a whole, food security, I believe is a matter of sovereignty for us. Uh, so you know programs are out there to help with food security, but if, if you wanna reach out to my wonderful team, Aisha, is putting her, her contact information in the chat box for those who wanna continue uh, this work. Um, we are supporting the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, along with hundreds of other organizations across the country right now, because we know that the best way to advance gender equality is by investing in you. All the research shows the best way to advance gender equality is by investing in grassroots. And we're doing it also because you are tenacious women who would not take no for an answer. And for years and years, you endured, despite the whims and values of the governments of the day, you kept pushing and you kept pushing until you brought governments on board. I know things are really, really hard right now, but don't lose sight of just how big a deal it is for the private sector, for the chambers of commerce to come out and say, we need childcare because it's important to our bottom line. That's progress and that cannot be taken for granted. I know things are really hard right now, but do not for a moment take for granted how incredibly important it is that Canada of all the countries in the world has been able to apply an intersectional gendered lens, not just to its federal budget, but we're applying it to our COVID response and we're number one in the world. I say that with humility too, because I know we have a lot of work to do and we're focused on it, but we're, we're looking through a lens that generations of activists and advocates have been, first of all, developing and asking for us to consider. Things are incredibly difficult right now, but we owe a great deal of thanks to essential workers, and we owe a great deal of thanks to care workers, and I have to say, the public service that I get to work with, the Public Service of Canada, this very big machine uh, in some very, you know, carved in stone ways of doing things because actually turns out you need stability within public service. It's good for democracy. They're working from home. They had to pivot. They have kids. They have elders. And yet they were able to respond to Canadians and be there for all of us in our hour of needs. They were processing a thousand Serb applications a minute in the early days, a minute because they knew that every minute counted, every minute mattered. So things are really hard right now. We've had some promising news about vaccine candidates. We are well prepared, thanks to colleagues like Anita Anand and the Prime Minister and Navdi Baines and so many others. Canada has been aggressive in its procurement and we're ready to go with the implementation once vaccine trials give us a green light. Things are really hard right now because of the tragedies and too many deaths and the isolation, but my friends, 
we're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this because we're Canadians. We're gonna get through this because on this line, we come from a long line of survivors who've endured all sorts of challenges, who've overcome all sorts of challenges. And we're gonna get through it because we're gonna stick together. There will be forces in this very difficult time who will seek to divide Canadians, who will seek to turn neighbor against neighbor, who will seek to disrupt the cohesion that is so necessary to a safe recovery from the pandemic with identity politics and divisions that are not needed. Our job, and I know that we ask a lot of leaders like you, but please dig deep and find that energy. Our job is to hold our communities together. Somebody asked, what can we do to educate folks about our challenges? Keep coming together like this, around virtual kitchen tables. Invite as many of us as you can, because as you can obviously tell, we are all hungry for these conversations right now. We are all hungry for these connections right now. It's these connections that'll keep us together and it's these connections that'll help us get through to the other side of this. So I wanna thank you so much for all the ways that you've prayed, that you've sent kind words, that you've stepped up. I saw a press release from yesterday that you're now offering legal aid support. Brilliant, congratulations. I am so proud to be part of this movement, to know that there are leaders like you in every corner of the country, and particularly to you Western folks. Honestly, I miss you, and I can't wait until we can be in the same spaces together. But until then, be safe. We need you. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Minister. I'm just going to pass this off to Ashifa so we can um, just wrap this up. I want to reiterate, uh, I will be dropping my email in as well. Aisha is always to also drop her in, and we will also send our email addresses to Ashifa so she can uh, send it to everyone uh, who participated today. Uh, but yeah, so if there's anything you'd like to follow up on, um, please feel free to reach out, especially I know someone asked about the particulars and technicalities of the Universal broadband fund and we're happy to connect you uh, to the proper channels there as well so please feel free and stay in touch and I'll pass it back to Ashifa. Thank you Joanna. Thank you Minister Monsef. Thank you for joining us at the kitchen table. You indeed covered a lot of ground. Thank you so much. Uh, there are many still questions and comments coming in so we do thank you uh, for, for your office to be available um, and to take our comments and questions. Um, I, I'm sorry that I rushed us at the beginning. I thought we were going to wrap up at 6.30. <laughs> thank you all for continuing to join us. We will just um, wrap up in a good way so that we can close off um, this wonderful conversation, this open discussion that we've had um, in a good way. May I please ask Shaisa Ali to unmute herself? Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Honorable Minister Munsef for being available for this virtual meeting greet with the CCMW chapters in Western Canada. We know you had a long day of back-to-back -back meetings, and we are so thankful that you stayed later than anticipated to spend time with this group of women to listen to our stories and to address our concerns. I'm floored that you basically like kept track, not just of what was being said by, by your speakers, but also what was going on in the chat. And, and you were able to address every question that came your way. So thank you, thank you so much um, for spending time with us. I know these are exceptional times. And while we look forward to that day when we can welcome you in person, we are so exceptionally grateful for the opportunity to have this virtual meeting with you at our kitchen table. We'd also like to thank uh, Joanna Lamb from the minister's office for coordinating with our team and for assisting us with all the technical logistics of setting up the Zoom call to make sure that this event was a possibility. Well, I was also super taken aback that we had her honor, uh, Salma Lakani, the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, to was able to join us this evening and that she was also able to listen to the stories that were shared and she made time with her very busy schedule to participate. Um, 
I'd like to thank the president of the Edmonton CCMW chapter, Nassim Karani, or Nassim Anti, as most of us call her, for being a mentor and role model to those of us who are newer to the CCMW family and for guiding us and leading us in planning this event. Um, we'd like to also express our gratitude to Ashifa Jiva for taking the lead on behalf of the Edmonton chapter to coordinate with the minister's office, to keep us on time and on track, uh, and being our wonderful MC and facilitator this evening. Um, there are so many people that were involved, so I'm not going to name any more names, um, but I'd like to thank the CCMW Vancouver, Calgary, and Edmonton chapters for coming together to organize this event, to get the word out in the various regions, um, and also to the CCMW national team for helping us with the registration and, and again, the technical logistics of this event. Um, finally, I'd like to thank all the individuals that were so courageous in sharing their stories uh, with us this evening and asking those difficult questions. And, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you uh, that you know joined us at this kitchen table and listened to the stories that were shared and and joined along in chat um, and and just expressed your your questions and comments as well. Thank you everyone for your participation. And thank you, Shaista, my fellow Edmonton chapter exec member. Um, may I please turn to Tyra Ibrahim for a closing prayer just before we all hit leave um, i'd like to also say thank you and be safe wear a mask and do practice self-care ahira thank you thank you ashifa um, so if you will all indulge me i'd like to do a short um, prayer in arabic and the translation in english um, arabic is not my first language so please forgive any mispronunciations <coughs> bismillahirrahmanirrahim Allahumma alif bayna kulubina wa asli zata baynina wa ahdina subul salami wa najina min al zulumati ila al nuri wa jannibna al fawahishi ma zahara minha wa ma batana wa barik lana fi asma'ina wa absarina wa kulubina wa azwajina wa dhuriyatina wa tab alayna innaka anta tawab al rahim ameen O oh Allah, put affection amongst our hearts, set right our matters between ourselves, guide us to the ways of peace, save us from darkness towards light, save us from all kinds of indecency, the apparent as well as the hidden, and bless our hearing, our seeing, our hearts, our spouses and our children, and turn in mercy upon us. Indeed, you are the one who greatly accepts repentance, one who is repeatedly merciful. Amin. Amin. Thank you all again very much. Please do direct comments and questions to the emails that have been included in the chat. And we can also send an email with, with those email addresses as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Bye -bye.